So I'm going to talk to you for the next half hour about the omnichannel client and the omnichannel advisor. So you heard from Noreen kind of the view from the firm level as well as some of the, the opportunities for the advisor. I'm going to start my talk focused on your client or your prospective client. And the way I'm going to do that is I'll talk about two really important trends that are reshaping every industry, including financial services. And then I'm going to talk about the implications for business. And those two trends are this concept, this idea of a constantly connected consumer who is always on multiple devices, multiple screens. And again, cross-generational. And the second sweeping change I'm going to talk about is the use of data analytics. Someone asked earlier, I think it was you, Rich, who said, you know, with, with these efficiencies, does it make sense to think that advisors or wholesalers or loan officers will, will be able to, to have a greater capacity? They'll, they'll have a bigger book and be able to serve more people at scale? And I think the answer is absolutely yes. You know, just like Uber democratized and expanded the market of who could afford and access private car service, the same thing is going to happen in financial services. So uh, let, me, let me talk about that. So let's start with our typical client. And Molly, where are you? There she is, Molly. So like many employees at Hearsay Social, Molly is your typical millennial. And just like other millennials you know, Molly is constantly connected. She's got her Apple Watch, she's got her iPhone, she's got her laptop, her iPad, you name it, she's got it. Now, what does Molly's client journey look like? Now, in this particular case, I'm going to walk you through how Molly would go through a financial advisor selection process, but you could really apply this to any industry. You know, picking a doctor, picking a dentist, picking a restaurant. I mean, this is just how people behave today. So let's start. So we know that people like Molly, most of the time, most of our clients, discover their advisor through a referral. They either proactively ask for it, or they overhear a friend or family member talking about their experience working with an advisor. So we, we know over 50% of the time around the world, this is how it works. But the interesting thing is that, oh, and, the, and then the other increasingly, 20, 30% of the time, Molly is actually just discovering this not directly one-on-one -on -one from someone, but it's an, it's an implicit referral because she's on social media, sc scanning through the Twitter feed, looking on LinkedIn, and she's seen that other people are, are talking about their advisor. The, the step two, though, is what is fascinating and it is new within, I'd say, the, the last five years or so. And that is that once Molly gets that referral, as much as she trusts Rachel, for having given her the referral, she's not just going to then meet with the advisor. She's not just going to then call the advisor. She does this crucial next step, which we all do, which is she researches and validates the referral. And, and by the way, she may have received several referrals, maybe two or three, because if she asks on her Facebook page, does anyone know a good financial advisor, she, she likely will get more than one answer. So step two, before she meets with them, she researches and validates. And of course, what do you, how do you research and validate someone? Anyone? You Google them, exactly. It's the same whether you're here. I was in, I was in Bangkok three, three weeks ago with some of you. People in Bangkok Google their financial advisor referral. I was in Milan last week. People in Italy, they Google that referral before they meet with that person. It's like universal behavior. And when Molly Googles the financial advisor, in this case, John Piazza, financial advisor in her town, what does she expect to find? She expects to find a website for him that's professionally branded but not overwhelming with legalese. She wants to have helpful information there. She wants to know who he is. She wants to find him on social media and see where he went to school. How long has he been a financial advisor? Does he work with other startup employees? Does he understand Molly's financial situation? Can he help people like me? And she wants to know on social media who else they might know in common, because she got the referral from Rachel. But if she can find out on Facebook or on LinkedIn that they also know Scott in common and, and Joe, well, now Molly can do more diligence. Before she wastes her time and wastes his time, she can ask Joe, hey, do you, you're connected with, with um, John on, on LinkedIn. Do you work with him also? Is he a trustworthy, value-added advisor, or am I just wasting my time? So that is a crucial step. Um, and, and by the way, like I said, it's not just financial services. My, my mother had eye surgery recently, and she did it at UCSF, one of the best hospitals in the world. 
and I don't need to Google UCSF, I know them, but guess what, we Googled the doctor because we wanted to know who is the individual surgeon, who is the individual service provider who will be operating on my mom. I wanna know about that person and I expect to find, again, qualifications, credentials, experience, education on that individual person. So that's step two. So assuming all goes well, at this point, Molly's kind of sold. She wants to, to talk to this person. She wants to, to meet with them. And so you know, she's, she's already done her validation on LinkedIn, so the easiest thing for her to do, the lowest friction thing for her to do, is she's just gonna message this guy. And so she's gonna say, you know, hey John, uh, I got your name from Rachel, and I also, I'm in need of financial advice. I work at a pre-IPO company. I have all these stock options. You know, I just need some advice. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Should I exercise them now? Should I, you know, what should I do with my 401k? Just help me plan this because I have no idea. And so at this point, she's gonna reach out through a digital channel most likely because people Molly's age don't like to get on the phone and call during your business hours. And then once they establish that relationship, once they have that initial call and that initial meeting, it's not like Molly's gonna sign right away. We know that today's skeptical client wants to kind of get to know you over a period of time. And, um, and over that time, she wants to learn and she wants to engage. She doesn't want to feel like she's being sold to. She doesn't want to get blasts about new products that you have. She wants to learn. She wants to understand from a content marketing perspective, from a nurturing perspective, what are the financial goals and steps that she should be doing that she doesn't yet know about? How can you add value to her beyond what she can just find on Google? So that is the role of the advisor. Now, Unfortunately, I just walked through that ideal client journey. Unfortunately, that is not the reality for most people like Molly and for most service providers in financial services she's trying to work with. Whether she's Googling for an advisor or she's Googling to make sure that a loan officer is legit and not scammy, or she's Googling for a business banker for her small business, the reality today is that oftentimes those people aren't findable and Googleable. And so put yourself in the shoes of Molly. What happens when you Google that advisor or that surgeon and there are no results found? What are you gonna do? Well, most people move on to the next referral. They move on to the next advisor. It's like a split second. They don't even think about it. Or what if the advisor was findable, but then when it came time for Molly to reach out to him on LinkedIn or on texting, he didn't write back. And I know the text is kind of small there, but she's texted him or she's messaged him a few times in succession with no response. What's she gonna do? Is she gonna keep trying? No, she's not. She's gonna move on to the next person. We all do the same thing. And that's just it. It's not just Molly, and it's not just millennials, and it's not just America. This is a universal behavior. You know, all around the world, in all 22 countries where Hearsay works today and the, the hundreds more out there, today, clients, have all the power for whatever we do, from restaurants to financial advisors to mortgages to business banking, you name it, to insurance, we all follow the similar journey. Google and Facebook have created these incredibly universal behaviors that shape client expectations and therefore must dictate how we respond and how our advisors respond. And so what do advisors need to do? Well, they need to adapt to this new universal omni-channel client journey. And while referrals are still a very powerful source of the initial name and the initial discovery phase, there are these new steps in the client journey that didn't exist even a few years ago, that all of a sudden it's a new skill that advisors need us to train them on and give them tools on. The research and validation step, more than ever, individual advisors and agents have to be Googleable. And when they're Googleable, it has to be a mobile optimized, search engine optimized website. But guess what? Most advisors don't know what SEO is. They don't understand about responsive design and so we have to do it for them. It's a, it's a really critical area of value that as a firm, you can deliver to your advisors and build that, that trust and relationship. Step three is, is reaching out through these digital means. You know, when someone calls your advisor's office or if they visit your branch, Imagine if you ignored them. You would never ignore them. You would never not pick up the phone. 
You pick up the phone on the first ring. This is this, the same thing is happening on digital, and yet advisors, because of regulation, because of lack of training, because of lack of tools, they are not responding, and that is just not acceptable. From a learning and engagement perspective, the days of sitting down with someone and expecting them to decide in that first meeting that they want to work with you, those days are over. Today's skeptical prospects need to be nurtured. They need to be cultivated. They want to learn. They want to know that you have something, you have knowledge and expertise that they can't just Google on their own and that you'll be truly value added. And so how do you do that at scale? You have to use digital. You have to be able to, to figure out a way to deliver the right insight and content and action to the right person at the right time through the right channel. And then finally, Amazon and Yelp have trained people to want to share their experiences. You know, in the past, you would ask for a referral, you'd get them, but today, people assume they'll give referrals, and, or they assume that they'll share that they've had a negative experience. That's just what people do. We, we live in a sharing society, financial services, credit cards, books, restaurants. People just want to rate and review and share their experiences. That is an important way now that people connect and build um, relationships with their friends. And so advisors, this, this is a new journey, and advisors need to understand and be equipped to deliver on this new journey. And so firms need to enable advisors each step of the journey. And omnichannel advisors are the only way that we can serve today's omnichannel client, who still wants to talk to someone, but, but wants to talk to that someone through texting, through social, through Google. And yet, if we were to take a look at the industry scorecard, if we were to take a really honest assessment of ourselves, whether we're in wealth management or insurance, whether we're in Asia or in Europe, North America or Latin America, most advisors have been left behind. Almost every firm who has a chief digital officer or focuses on digital has invested almost exclusively on the left side of the circle, which is digital direct to consumer. Some firms have also invested in tools between the firm and the advisor. Very few firms have done justice to enabling the digital connections between their advisors and their client. That is the missing link. And that creates a broken client experience. Because it, it's great if you have a robo-advisor. It's great if you have a mobile banking app. But it's confusing for Molly when she's, she's taking a picture of her check and depositing it. But then when she goes to text her advisor a simple question, the advisor can't text her back. And that's exactly what's happening to millions of people around the world. And so advisors have been left behind. And what's happening to Molly all too often is when she's acting on the referral, when she's trying to do the right thing and start to plan for her future, this is what she's delivered. I mean, we can do better than this. We have to do better than this. It's, it doesn't make any sense that you'd have this, this otherwise wonderful relationship manager, top producer, who either has no website or a website that's worse than the nail salon down the street. And that's embarrassing. That's something that they're not proud of. You, they would never do that in their office. They'd never have a busy signal when you call their office. Why are, you, why are you doing the equivalent of that on digital? But of course, we know advisors today, they're overwhelmed. You know, they're dealing with all the faxes, sub subsidizing the fax industry. They're still dialing for dollars. There's tons of paperwork that they're overwhelmed with. They're spending a lot of their time picking stocks. And so to add to that is, overwhelming, right? We're asking them to suddenly learn social selling. We're adding another silo for email. We're telling them, oh, by the way, there are all these new DOL compliance requirements. We don't completely understand them yet, but stay tuned. It's more work for you. Um, by the way, we also need you to keep, to, to update your website in a completely separate system. Oh, and by the way, we need you to start using CRM and giving us all of your contact data of these clients who you view as yours. This is overwhelming. This is the message that we're inundating advisors with today, and it just won't work. They're not going to be able to make the transition if we do that. So that's the, the, the constantly connected consumer and the challenges and the opportunities. Now on the data analytics side. So traditionally, most client outreach, particularly outreach that came from the advisor, looked like this. Does anyone know what this is? Any physics people? It's a black hole, right? Advisors, all, I mean, a lot of our marketing efforts, we, we run billboard ads, we try to measure them. Advisors send out these mailers, they, they, they leave voicemails, they send out emails, they do all of these things, but it's kind of a black hole. It kind of gets, goes, we don't know where, right? There's some, 
some place that it disappears to. But it doesn't have to be that way. Other industries that can use other tools because they're not as highly regulated as, as financial services have, have shown the way. Amazon has shown the way, Google has shown the way that when your interactions move from analog to digital, you end up creating all of this exhaust, this digital exhaust, AKA big data, that can be harvested to unlock incredible insights. And this was really the basis of, of why Steve and I decided to focus our company on financial services. We realized the very place that people now go to share these moments of truth when they're getting married, when they're expecting their first child, after they call mom and dad and grandma, the first place they go to tell their friends is social media. And so how do we start to harvest these insights and not just use marketing as a push and have it disappear into the ether, but also to use these interactions as, as insights to help deliver and for us to focus on who we should be reaching out to, when we should be reaching out, and what we should say. And advisors are actually really good at this. When they're in person or on the phone, advisors are masters at listening for verbal cues. They're looking for those keywords. They're trying to understand based on the questions that the, the prospect or client is asking, what, are the, what is the client really getting at? What solution would map well to this person's need state? When they're face-to-face -face in person or even on video these days, advisors are the best. They're pros at being able to look at body language and saying, oh gosh, Molly has her arms crossed. She's probably not that interested. Or Steve's asleep. You know, he's not even, he, he clearly, what I'm saying isn't resonating with him. Well, digital signals are really no different. It's just that there's far more of them. And for as often as an advisor might meet with a client, there's infinitely more time that they're not with a client where there's now digital exhaust, digital signals that they can benefit from and similarly use to tailor their outreach to become much more bespoke, much more customized. And by the way, connecting silos, when you take your lead system versus your CRM versus what the advisors and clients are doing together versus compliance records, when you bring that all together, these insights are even more powerful. And I think the next decade of technology in this industry is really going to be connecting these silos. I mean, even at Hearsay, we started with social media, and what we realized was, in addition to being able to simplify the advisor experience, bringing some of these silos together, we realized from a data opportunity that the only way you can actually know certain things is if you break open the silos. So I'll give you a really tactical example, but I think it's illustrative. So if Scott visits John's advisor website, Hearsay will start tracking Scott. We'll know that he spent five minutes reading about 401k rollover. We know that he spent seven minutes reading about um, tax planning and, and two minutes reading about college savings plans. But we don't actually know that it's Scott unless he fills out a lead form. And all of us know most people don't fill out lead forms. However, if I'm running a Hearsay mail campaign to Scott, which I am, uh, and he clicks on the link, the moment he clicks, I can now combine those cookies and now I know that anonymous website visitor number 76 who spent two minutes reading this and six minutes reading that, that's sham at transamerica.com. And that's the thing. I mean, you can't do that unless you have multiple channels and you're connecting the dots between those different pieces. And it's the future. Your advisors need every advantage. I started off today talking about these four concurrent challenges, these headwinds that are touching every single business within financial services. Aging advisor population, these, these attackers, these new entrants, you'll hear from them today, regulatory um, storm, and then this changing client behavior across all segments and demographics. Your advisors need every advantage in order to be able to navigate these uncertain waters of change. And so the implications for business, I mean, for us, we said, gosh, our mission is we need to take these archaic sales organizations that are littered across financial services in every country, and we have to modernize them. And we're going to modernize them with, a dig with an easy-to-use digital toolkit and predictive analytics. Like, we're going to give them what many other industries have been using for years, but that this industry hasn't had access to because of regulation. Oh, and by the way, we're going to take the records retention requirement in this industry, which traditionally was really onerous, and we're going to turn it into a positive. Because, by the way, when you're a big data company, you love records retention. It gives you more data to work with. 
So that's what we did. Company highlights, you know that many of you know the story. Steve and I started the, the company out of my living room just a few blocks from here. Seven years ago, we've raised $50 million in venture capital. We continue to be headquartered um, right around here in, in San Francisco, but we now have, uh, we work with, with organizations in financial services across 22 countries. We divide our business actually into five segments. I apologize, we only show three of them here. We started with insurance agents. We expanded to wealth managers and advisors. Then we moved into B2B with asset management wholesalers. More recently, we've added thousands upon thousands of mortgage loan officers, as well as business and commercial bankers. The, the same, we see the recurring theme in all of these. It's the same four challenges and the same opportunities to modernize and become more efficient and relevant to today's client. Hearsay enables the omnichannel advisor. And only through an omnichannel advisor can we serve the needs of today's retail and institutional clients. We, instead of having five, six, seven different siloed systems to log into, we give salespeople one place to go. One place to go where they can connect their text message account, their Facebook profile, their LinkedIn profile, their website, their email marketing, everything in one place, and it's also on their mobile app because we know they, like their clients, are always on the go. And from an insights perspective, it's no longer just social signals, it's web signals, it's email signals, it's text signals, all in one place, because again, advisors need every advantage. And if they can only make five calls an hour, if they can only meet with so many people in a day, we wanna make sure they're meeting with the best person in that moment of truth need state with the right advice. So who owns social and digital? Raise your hand if you own social and digital. That's your job, okay. So about half of you, that was actually a trick question because social and digital are everyone's job. This is the thesis of my book, so now you don't have to read it. Uh, the, my thesis is that in this day and age where social and digital have pervaded everything, all of how we work, how our clients experience the world, how our employees experience the world, every single person from the board of directors down to the frontline salesperson has to personally take ownership of understanding, using, and applying these technologies. And specifically, what does that look like? Well, if you're in sales management, if you're a branch manager, if you're the overall head of sales and distribution, what do you have to do? Well, number one, you have to lead by example. Because it's one thing to tell or ask your advisors to get on social. It's another if you yourself are tweeting, if you yourself are posting on LinkedIn, if you yourself have a great vibrant presence, which by the way, helps build your leadership. So that's very important. Number two is we know that incentives drive behavior and what we focus on and get, gets measured ends up being what we focus on. And so providing the analytics, and we have this new sales manager dashboard, so it works for every level of, of a sales organization that shows a roll-up view of all the reps in your office, in your territory, how are they doing on digital? So that you can start managing to these metrics and you can say, you know, hey Andy, you know, you, you haven't posted anything on social for, for, for three months, what's going on? Or Dan, why haven't you set up your website yet? You haven't uploaded your profile picture. It's so basic and it is, is so important for establishing trust when those prospects Google you. Um, so managing the metrics, really important, just like we manage them today for asking how many meetings they've set up, how many um, discussions they've had with, with um, clients, spouses, and, and kids. This is just another thing we have to start measuring as part of a, a scorecard. And the number three is, again, really important, taking social and digital from these siloed, one-off programs and integrating them, not only with each other, but also into practice management. So it, social and digital won't succeed if it's off to the side. It has to be part of the standard operating procedure of client engagement. This is, this is how we will sell going forward. This is how we will serve our clients going forward. So that's sales management. Marketing, another example. Jeff, where are you? So Jeff, really interesting role. He is the chief digital and marketing officer at Penn Mutual. This is a new role. And Eileen McDonald, who is the CEO and chairman of Penn Mutual, realized, gosh, I can't hire a chief marketing officer who doesn't also own digital. Digital is everyone's job. Digital has pervaded the entire client experience and also cuts across product, it cuts across claims, it cuts across service. There, you, we can't separate out digital as its own role. And so she invented this new role and she hired Jeff. And an example is that one of, they, they've had a really successful 
initially offline sponsorship with rugby, which is the fastest growing sport in America. I didn't know that. But um, it's huge, right? Huge viewership. And they said, well, we've already done this sponsorship. We've got tape, TV, radio, print, billboard. Why wouldn't we leverage and mobilize the thousands upon thousands of salespeople we have in the field to also talk about rugby? Because chances are, it's really important in their communities, and it's a way for them to build goodwill in that reservoir of trust with the relationships that, that they have in each of their respective towns. And so they did. And the advisors loved it too, because the advisors on their own wouldn't be able to do this level of national sponsorship, and yet they can benefit from having these conversations and, and, and building connections and staying top of mind with their communities. But it's not just sales, it's not just marketing. IT and compliance, we know we have a number of technology and, and legal and compliance leaders here in the room today. Um, we know that you know, the, for, for too long in this industry, we've been battered by regulation, and it's, it's all too easy for our default answer to be no. But it can't be no, because JFK said it, said it well. You know, the costs and risks to a program, to acting, there are costs and risks, but it's far less than comfortable inaction and, 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 and complacency. And no time has it been more true than today, where rapid technological change and a rapidly evolving client experience are the new normal. I thought Mark Zuckerberg said it more succinctly than JFK. The biggest risk was not taking any. Right? This is when things are stable, you can, you can, you're managing just to, to, to stay even. When things are changing rapidly and there's high volatility, that's when you need to act. And that's when leadership, leaders are made, I, I, in, in my opinion. We all know that in all of our businesses, the greatest predictor of client loyalty, of NPS, of client satisfaction, of revenue is frequent quality touch points from advisors, especially during moments of truth. We all know this. When, at the end of the day, when your client goes to, to tell a friend about their advisor, um, Mark, who has done a great job, they don't say, oh, you gotta work with Mark. He charges 20 basis points less than the other guy. That's not what they say. They don't say, oh, Mark, um, he's got, um, he was, you know, he, he he has a better office than, than somebody. Like they, they don't say that. They say, Mark was there for me when my dad died. Mark was there for me when I lost my job and I had to figure out how I would still pay for my twin girls to go to college next year. I mean, that's what they talk about. And there's social media is just littered with this information. And so let's connect these advisors to these opportunities. Let's make sure that they achieve the table stakes of being on the omni-channel journey. Let's give them predictive tools so that they don't have to, they, they can be more efficient in their outreach and so that they can free their time to do what clients value the most. And so in closing, um, we gotta get rid of, we gotta change the way that advisors work. There's obviously a lot of change management involved. And in order to survive, and I would say beyond survive, in order to thrive, we must bring advisors along in the digital transformation journey. We can continue to invest in direct apps. We can continue to build robo-advisors. We can continue to build mobile banking. But we have to bring advisors and our existing core business along um, for us to, to succeed in the future. Um, the future is bright. There are these incredible challenges around the world. But I think these are the times that define us as leaders and as companies. So thank you for joining us this week. We're just delighted to have you here in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm.